recorded at Get a Grip Studios in Toronto, Canada. A Get a Grip Management production and in association with the Get a Grip on Lighting podcast. Presented by the National Association of Innovative Lighting Distributors, the National Lighting Bureau, the Illuminating Engineering Society, and of course, the International Dark Sky Association. This is Starving for Darkness. Hang on a second here, folks. That's right. Hang on a second. Michael Colligan, co-host of Starving for Darkness here. Just to tell you real quick before we get into the conversation, which is super important for you to hear, that you need to go to keystonetech.com. That's K-E-Y-S-T-O-N-E-T-E-C-H.com, especially if you're a contractor or a distributor, Greg Eric. That's right. And they're coming out with a new exterior line of product, or they have come out with it, and they're going to continue to add to it, and they're dedicated to making dark sky friendly lighting uh, and potentially dark sky compliant as we go for now though they do have a dark sky full cut off wall pack a variety of wattages kelvin temperatures and a precision crafted optical lens that's ideal for increased fixture spacing and uniformity so less lighting fixtures needed because it, it can provide more light out of the one fixture so check that out Go to KeystoneTech.com. That's right. Hold on. Here comes Starving for Darkness. But before, K-E-Y-S-T-O-N-E-T-E-C-H.com. Hello, listeners. Welcome to another episode of Starving for Darkness. My name is Jane Slade, and I'm here with my co-host, Michael Colligan. And we're so excited to have our guest, Mark Klipsham, off on the show today. Mark is a visionary. There's no other way to put it. And his visions for what architecture could be for the planet come through to the tiniest details with even these words in his email signature. Architecture is about people and their desired relationship with their environment. I'm so excited to dig into your work and what you envision. But before that, we start each podcast episode with the same question for our listeners. And that is, could you please tell us about a dark sky experience that you had that really was profound and moved you on a human level. Wow. Uh, um, (laughs) It was college uh, and Mm. out out at the local park. We're going to leave some of the details out. Uh, It was next to a lake. (laughs) And uh, very, it was all public land, so one of the few places you really did get stars. And I was sitting, yeah, it was totally starry sky, sitting at the bottom of a tree, early spring, and off on the other side of the lake was this really long thunderstorm going on, so you could watch the lightning trace back and forth, Mm -hmm. you know, it was a beautiful dark night. And I looked up into the tree, excuse me, which was all dark against the sky, the stars, and I had this epiphany that the tree going up into the sky was roots into the sky. So it was mm. kind of like the tree holding the sky down and just kind of like holding the earth and the sky together with the background mm-hmm. of stars. Uh, that was, I put it this way, 35 years later, I still remember it very clearly. Mm. It, was, it was magical, magical evening. Well, it's kind of a bit of- for what you're describing in a way, which is the way that really trees are are moved with light. So their roots, you know, we kind of consider them in the ground, but all of that energy, which makes them possible and which makes them become is coming from the light above. And I was actually just walking down the street recently and the, the leaves on the tree have not come yet. So you could see the phototropism, which is the the direction of the growth towards mm-hmm. the light, so clearly, and it just looked like these like tendrils just like desiring the tree, the light so much. So I I I feel your your story very much because I've had a similar vibe recently, and so 
you know, Mark, you really are a visionary. You had sent forth uh, an email with a lot of images of beautiful projects that you see as being a potential solution for our industry. And so here are a couple quotes of, of yours. You've said, every streetlight wipes out a thousand stars. That's a good one. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then another one, you said, light pollution is a symptom of a bigger systemic condition. Systems working at odds with each other and inefficiency. Problems make more money than solutions. <laughs> and I think this is really the heart of your, your vision because you're just seeing a system that's not working. So can you talk about your life's work and the important, important moments that brought you to where you are with us now on this podcast called Starving for Darkness? One of the biggest frustrations I've run into is things are the way they are for a reason, and usually it has to do with profit. Innovation that saves energy and materials and labor is not welcomed with open arms, one would think. Um, If I could digress for just a second here, I don't know if uh, either of you two have a working definition of addiction, (laughs) <laughs> but my my observation is, well, I think it's partly dictionary too. An addiction is a habit you engage in which is unhealthy, mm. but you can't stop yourself. Above and beyond that, the addiction usually grows in intensity to get the same effect. And the effect that's desired is control over one's life in a situation where one feels one does not have control over that. Ergo, I can do some heroin, drink some beer, you know, uh, light up my backyard. You know, Mm. my gosh, the touch of a switch, I can change my reality. But it's not healthy. I can go eat Mm -hmm. some, uh, you know, big triple bacon cheeseburger, you know, and it's going to make me feel instantly satiated and satisfied. But I know in the long run, it's not good for me. Mm -hmm. Um, There's a whole bunch of people out there that want me to be, for lack of a better term, addicted to these things. They want continuous revenue. The fallout of that is we have lit up skies at night, which bother migrating animals, which bother local animals. We have a healthcare crisis. Uh, I'm also plugged into the super bright headlight phenomena, which I recently found out there are no regulations for that. Well, these are horrible. Guess what? Next year, they're going to be worse because the competing companies are want something bigger, faster, brighter. I was like, I literally carry a piece of blue plexiglass with me in my car that cuts down the oncoming traffic because it gives me a headache in about four seconds. I mean, it's mm. just, I scarred my retinas with a sun lamp as a child. So that's all blue spectrum. And mm-hmm. I, you know, sensitive to light anyway, but that, the, the blue spectrum is particularly bad. And the worst part about dark sky, and once again, better, faster, brighter, is they're going from lower Kelvin temperature bulbs to higher, uh, evolutionary-wise, up until, what, 100, 150 years ago? Anything after sunset was candle, fire, kerosene, tallow candle, something like that. Very, very low light levels. Excuse me, very low light temperature and low light Mm -hmm. levels. In my house, I've got, I wish I could almost show them to you. They're these little courtesy step LEDs that are amber and -hmm. they shine at the ground and they're two feet off the ground. After sunset, I rarely turn lights on. That's my light in the house. Very soothing, very relaxing. You are speaking my language, Mark. I don't turn the lights on a lot of the time. I will tell you this Friday night, I actually kept the lights off the entire night. And it's like a sensory deprivation tank. You really, we are, our, our, our visual systems are so overstimulated. You don't really need an entire sensory deprivation tank. Start with the visual system and that will take you places. So I'm pleased to hear someone else has a similar practice. Well, you say sensory deprivation <clears throat> when I think it's evoking different senses. Mm, so good point. it's like the, the overstimulated ones are numbing you to that 
whereas subtlety, oh, well, you go to these concerts, you say they're too loud. You're just getting old. No, I'm not. I know what good quality sound is. Give me a break. Uh, local theater near here, uh, I would say pretty close to world famous. You can stand on the stage and just talk, and they can hear you up in the upper balconies. And then they'll come in and just blast this, like volume has something to do with value. Mm. It's like, no, I want quality. I don't want quantity. The, the street lighting, same thing. It's like, I literally go out and shield my eyes half the time when I'm driving down the street at night. It's just, it's just horrible. So what in particular about the current state of lighting drives you nuts? The fact that it's supporting, to my mind, dinosaur technology. Um, mm -hmm. Pretty much the over lighting is about our transportation system directly and indirectly. You have a used car lot. It's on at three o'clock at night in the morning. Not quite sure who's shopping for cars at three o'clock in the morning, but I can see those lights from my house three miles away. Mm -hmm. um, and can you repeat the question again really quick? Well, what in particular about the vast lighting industry drives you in particular nuts? So I, the, I can definitely, you know, those the reason those used car lots are on is because the owner feels someone's going to steal the used car. So it's it's a way of protecting, uh, although I don't think it would stop anyone. It's not a rope tying the hands <laughs> of the stealer. Well, and, and so, it's actually d disingenuous in that respect. Because if the lights are on all the time, if I'm designing a lake house and they say, oh, we want a street light on our driveway so it'll be light when we get there and leave, mind you what, they're there two weeks out of the year and the other 50 weeks it's on continuously? Yuck. So that car lot, I won't call it a conspiracy, but the insurance companies often require that for safety, but if I was a police officer, for example, I'm worried about crime, lights are on all the time. With that house scenario, I say, those burglars know when you're there and when you're not. They're mm. using your street light to load their van with your stuff, okay? <laughs> if you want to stop them, no kidding. You want to stop them, have a motion sensor detector and have it turn a light on and upstairs, and maybe the fakey dog barking or something like that. It'll give them just enough cause for concern to go, eh, let's, I know they're not here, but let's go next door. I don't want this. So the parking lot is incentivized by the utilities because they have all this extra energy out there that's doing nothing. If I was a law enforcement officer, you know, oh, lights are on, they're always on. Well, what if I was a half mile away and all of a sudden, I see the lights go on. I could just see the light, you know, on the, up on the clouds or whatever. I go, huh, I wonder what's going on over there. I better I should go check that out. That seems to me like it would be far more effective as a way of telling people what's going on than them just being on all the time. <clears throat> One of the things that, that people say, like, is that true? Well, aren't you taught to turn lights off when you leave the room? And isn't there a... Uh, occupancy sensor in the bathroom and, 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 and all these things to save energy. But somehow at night, the formula completely flips the other way of don't bother putting switches on anything because, sorry, this is garbage we're getting rid of. It's waste right. energy. It, it has no purpose now. From a design standpoint, there's a thing called conceptual blockbusting. It's like, well, why are you thinking this? Is it because that's what's going on or that's what you've been led to believe is going on for another agenda? So that makes sense. Yes, that makes perfect sense. So tell me this, if this is all wasted garbage energy, which we have no respect for any anymore because we have saved all this energy. So now we can just spend freely so we don't really care. But in your ideal world, and this really touches into your, your visionary work, where where could we use this energy instead of blocking the night sky? I gotta say it's 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 a it's a backup in perspective a little bit. You've got this big machine 
it's not like a gas generator out, you know, it's powering your camper or something like that. This is a, a very large utility and there's logistics to take into account. I, I, there's so many things about this that the general people don't know. I'm not an expert at any means, but I do know that once something's running, if you leave it alone, it's much less likely to fail, have problems, et cetera. Whereas if you, you know, dial it up and dial it down, don't mess with it. If it's working, leave it alone, right? Okay, you're talking about huge power generation facilities. You can't mm-hmm. afford them to go wrong. It's less expensive for them to maintain them and operate them to keep a fairly even production capacity going. In my email, I put out the scenario. It's it's May 3rd, which is, by the way, is, wow. Okay, that's totally freaky because that's yesterday. <laughs> you know, and it, it's, it's 65 degrees and it's three o'clock in the morning. There is no power demand. What do you do with that? Well, you're still generating mm-hmm. all this. So, there's the uh, yard lights, the ones I described, don't have switches on them. It's $10 a month. You're like, oh, I go for it. I'll just leave it on all the time. Parking lights, same thing. Uh, street lights, all that kind of stuff. We are starting to develop an interesting coincidence that electric vehicles are coming online. Right now, the argument is, well, you're not really saving a lot of energy because you still have to generate this. You know, well, as it were, it is more efficient because you're producing at a larger scale. You know, the combustion engine with its inefficiencies and that sort of thing. <clears throat> but hey, let's go park that car in our garage at night and have a timer on it to where it's charging at two or three o'clock in the morning. Let's have what used to be a gas station is now going to be a charging station with, sorry, Tesla, universal batteries. That, oh, I'm driving down the road. I'm going from here to there. Oh, got quarter of a quote unquote tank left. I'm going to pull into this place. I'm going to switch my battery out for their battery. I'm going to be out of there in three minutes. They're going to be charging those batteries once again, two, three, four o'clock in the morning. Very low rates, no draw on the system. That's free energy. Let's use it for something. You saw the Small houses, well, they can be big houses, whatever. I happen to think small houses are kind of cool. They are so efficient. Uh, I don't know if I can say you can heat them with a fart and a candle, but I just did. Uh, did you? Are those <laughs> real so houses? Did you, build, did you build that house? Are they built? Oh, absolutely. Okay. So I just want to. I want to push many. back. I want to push back a little bit on you here because I, I, I don't think a lot of people understand that electricity is produced on demand. Okay, and that grid scale electric, uh, yes, it's produced on demand for sure. So it cannot be stored, okay. And in places like Ontario, which is like eighty percent nuclear power, you can't shut the reactors off. So once the reactor exactly. is running, you cannot shut the reactors off. Which kind of is interesting because um, a lot of the incentives for lighting in Ontario are inverted. So they. It's almost like they caught like an incentive flu from other utilities that use coal and natural gas to produce energy Mm -hmm. because nuclear is the way of the future. Unfortunately, most people don't like that. But if we want to stop producing greenhouse gases, there's a sort of a meeting of the minds now with many serious environmentalists that it has to be nuclear grid scale level energy. But all that being said, there was a, I listened to the, the, the president of Ontario Power Generation uh, give a speech. And so be, Ontario had so much clean energy. Well, if you consider nuclear clean, okay, that's up to you. Quebec has so much nope. uh, <laughs> hydroelectricity. It's fine. Um, but uh, has so much hydroelectricity and, and Ontario has so much clean nuclear energy or non-carbon producing energy, if you prefer that term. Okay. That we have to pay to get rid of it. It's very crazy. Okay. So we, we have so much energy that we have to pay Michigan and New York state and other jurisdictions to take our clean electricity and use it for free because they can turn, they can turn down gas plants and coal power plants in these places. Mm -hmm. You cannot do that with nuclear. Okay. So he made the announcement. He said, if everyone in Ontario buys an electric car, the price of electricity will go down in Ontario. He made that announcement which is interesting. So you say, okay, but why, why is that, Mr. President? Well, that's because everybody will charge their cars. The vast majority of people will be charging their electric vehicles in the evening time. 
And so that will allow us to have, uh, you know, our baseline of energy that that would shuts down at nine o'clock and starts to go down. And then we're paying to get rid of this energy because we can't turn these nuclear power plants down. OK, that will allow us to use that energy up. OK, so I agree with you. The only the only thing I would say is that while your your vision, you know, it's a vision, it seems great. I don't think it's grounded in reality, Mark. I feel like there's a lot of things that when I read your essay, especially if you don't like nuclear, um, I don't know how you can possibly create the, create the energy that we need to live the way we want to live. And it's fine that people say, well, we can't live this way anymore. Well, you know, I'm not sure that that's possible. So can you, can you explain to me how your plan addresses the need for grid scale energy in a realistic way? I'm saying we already generate way more energy than we need. I'm not I'm not proposing generating more energy. I'm proposing using the energy we have to begin with. So the car scenario, those batteries, the homes I designed, they would power those for weeks. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm charging them at night. Where it comes from, a uh, unicorn dong i don't care mm. <laughs> what i'm saying sure. is is energy's out there there is no bucket of electricity you know you do something with it so i'm producing this my scenario is that by utilizing this energy at three o'clock in the morning to charge batteries at these former gas stations to charge my so so on my house maybe i've got voltaics you know maybe i'm using the wind energy nearby not consistent I'm charging these batteries with that, regardless of where it comes from. Energy is already being produced. It's just not being used. And no, they don't have to get rid of it. They could just let the wheel spin. It just doesn't go anywhere. Once again, you can't store it. Uh, worst case and worst case scenario, and I interface with a lot of people like this. I've got some fairly good numbers on it. Worst case scenario, what if you took that extra energy? Oh, so what I was saying is, once that energy starts to be used at three o'clock in the morning, it becomes more value. It has value. So now dumping it into my neighborhood at night and car lots and that kind of thing, it's not going to be so cheap anymore. It's going to start to cost some real coin and it's going to give some incentive for people. Well, maybe we don't need the lights on all the time, or maybe we only have 50% of them on the time. We're not going to quantum leap here. It's going to be one step at a time, and we're going to find out that it's better that way. Uh, so, like I said, we're going to use that energy to charge batteries. Worst case scenario, what if we were to use that? It's only like 12% efficient now. What if you were uh, using electrolysis? Not electrolysis. One of them's hair removal. One of them's splitting water into hydrogen and oxygen. <laughs> Very different. Uh, at least use it for that rather than polluting my sky at night. You know? I agree. Uh, I agree with you on that. I th like we agree on the dark sky issue. I'm just I'm curious to see. So um, the next question I have for you, and I actually have a definition of addiction too, um, that okay. I think you, that you might like. Um, I'll just say it right now. Addiction could be could be defined as any self destructive activity engaged in habitually chronically or as intermittent bitch events that in the long term serves to remove your access to the people and places you love. Mm. How's that? Isn't that what the growth economy is doing? Well, I, okay. It, so I agree with you that America <laughs> is on, uh, listen, America's on a tra and Canada as well is on a trajectory away from what it purports to be and towards oligarchic control. Uh, okay. I agree with not, that. It's not sustainable. It, it is the antithesis of, the economy grows at the expense of the environment. There, tied it up in a little bow. No, okay. and, and now also I believe now at the expense of the people um, as well. Oh, because our health. It, it's I, all I, the same thing. Yeah, I, I, I see America becoming very much an all, uh, very much oligarch with oligarchic characteristics, particularly within this pandemic um, situation that we we seem to find ourselves in. But I, I got one for you. I got no, one for you. I have a question so, that fo oh, follows up right, on that. Okay. Okay. How do you say you don't like profit? Well, how, how do you, Oh, how do, no, 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 I did not. I never, I, capitalism is the most wonderful thing in the world. I wish we had it. So you have an issue with, uh, there you go. You have an issue with the tend towards oligarchy as opposed to, um, uh, free enterprise, 
with social capitalism, which is kind of a, a sort of a different description. More we have we have corporatism at best. Uh, there are so many. Oh gosh, can of worms! I didn't know you're going to open up a huge can of worms. <laughs> I love cans of worms, by the way. Sure. Um, okay, so so I, I came up with this analogy. I happen to be reading the Old Testament right now. Someone said doesn't it burn in your hands? I said, no, I want to be educated and know why things are the way they are. Um, Gosh, where was I going with that? Oh, so all of a sudden it became clear to me, you talked about oligarchy. I think it's almost more of a religion. We have a priest caste now. It's those lobbyists, those legislators, uh, the attorneys. You cannot access God directly. You have to go through the priests and you have to tithe. Mm. Our system of making laws is out of our reach now it, it's we are not in direct contact with it and of course they have their agenda and their agenda is their buddies and themselves first their self-protectionism so let's keep things institutionalized change is not good innovation is not welcome because we like things the way they are we took a long time to get them like that so take your silly little concerns and go somewhere else Try to get a hold of your legislator sometime. You're going to get a form letter back about something you didn't even write them about. So I know we're, heaven we're, forbid the president. we're kind of detouring off here, but I want to ask you I, about I, that. I have a question okay. for you. Do you think that is why, Over, because I'm very interested in this topic, because there seems to be a, a reduction. So, for example, in Ontario, if this is Ontario, Canada, okay, so not Ontario, mm-hmm. California or anything like that, not even the same country, okay, the U.S. presidential election is more popular in Ontario and more important to people, most people in Ontario than their mm. local councillors. The people have no idea who their local, what we call, you guys would call congressmen, would be MP in Canada. Your local state representatives would be, Congress state Congress would be MPPs in Ontario. People have no idea who these people are. And there's like this suction sucking power at the top of U.S. politics, which is bringing everything from the local and state and putting it to the federal government. Um, do you think that that's a sim that, that, that's not a, that's not a question that's happening. So power is being sucked away from the local and from the state level governments and being kind of hoarded by the federal government. Do you think that's a symptom of what you're talking about? Well, I say that's, that's what they're doing in our state as well. Uh, they're, it's the term usurping local control on any mm. number of things. I, I literally live in the middle of three farm fields right here. I cannot grow a garden until I can't start putting my garden in until they're done spraying. Every year it gets knocked down. You know, it's like this is protected. Mm. The 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 confined spraying. You're talking about spraying. You're talking about spraying Roundup. Every time. Uh, well, and now it's two two four D is all well because the sure. Roundup's not working, even though they promised that it would work forever. Well, these funny promises made. Sure. There's nothing sacred anymore. The yeah. land isn't sacred. My life isn't sacred. Remember the 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 phone calls the solicitors it's like they're going to bother me 24 7 there's no rules anymore when it comes to making profit in a growth economy because the profit need is driven by investors who the only thing they introduce into the system is money not labor not materials anything else they're basically parasites so the only thing they want is growth and growth at any cost. If that means throwing plastic in the ocean, if it means lights at night, if it means that doesn't anything, if it means feeding people garbage, go to the grocery store, see what's for sale. Uh, that's what's going to be. I wish we had something on the order of a stable economy, which serves you, me, and most everybody else. Then we can move towards a sustainable economy. I know that's blasphemous almost. Uh, And at that point, we'll not need the addiction of instant gratification and constant satiation. We might actually have a community and a family. I did a a community plan, which is so, I, I realized why it will never happen because it includes live work. People can work in their home. Well, who's going to support Amazon? You know, who's going to who's going to go to the burger franchise? You know. So uh, just a, gonna, ju- where, where, I think what the, what's right. interesting about what you're saying is the symptom you noted in your in the in the um in the in the 
thing you wrote. I don't know what you call it. Treaties. Email, sure. Call it Treaties. Sure. <laughs> it, was, it was interesting. Synop- was a symptom of this is, is light pollution. It's interesting mm-hmm. how like the, the <clears throat> symptom of this kind of creeping, um, overbearing societal thrust is like this light everywhere. And Jane, I don't pollution know. Pollution in general. Yeah, well, but, no, but, the, the, but it's visible. It's Light excessed. pollution is is totally visible to everybody. Jane, how do we bring this issue for what he's talking about, sort of our societal issues and then light pollution being a symptom of that? We're stuck in Javon's paradox. The more cheaper something mm-hmm. becomes, the more you use of it. Of it. Um, how do we get – How do go ahead, uh, Mark, yeah. Healthcare. Healthcare. Absolute parallel. Mm. The sicker you are, the more profitable you are. Tell me that's not true. Pharmaceutical companies, uh, healthcare systems, billions and bi- trillions of dollars. The worst thing that could happen tomorrow would you would start to eat healthy and exercise every day. <laughs> let's let's not promote that. I was saying well, my uh, think, diatribe. We'll call it, sorry. I think what it. we're we're kind of all describing is that there's a detachment that's happening to our surrounds, whether it's the removal of local government to go to a more federal control, or it is the creeping of light all around us that we have no control over to turn the lights off. And this, this lack of um, agency that we have over our own environment it's it's being we're seeing it in the, the way that we're being governed we're seeing it in the way that our surrounds are happening all around us so it it's a i i really like the way that you think so globally mark because you're really pointing to the fact that this is a symptom and it's not just a singular fact and we do tend to focus on this fact light pollution on the show starving for darkness simply because in my opinion it is one of the most overlooked and atrocious forms of pollution that we are having and that people are not taking it seriously enough. And so we are bringing great focus to that by developing the conversation. But with you, Mark, I think it's pretty fascinating to see light pollution within your framework as just a symptom of the sort of detachment that we all feel from having authority in our own world. So what is the solution to something like that? How do we give people the feeling that they have agency and authority in their own surrounds? What What is, so if healthcare's pr- problem is how do we, you know, you know, sickness sells, then, and, and if light pollution's problem is brightness sells, what is the solution in your mind? Because you have so many beautiful solutions that you're outlaying in your treatise, your essay that you sent. Um, so I'd love to hear some of the more positive spins on this for our listeners who, you know, I don't want to get them too depressed. So <laughs> I agree. No, 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 no. I agree. But the, la- the, last, the last thing I want, I don't want compromise. I have this bizarre idea. I want to turn to the return to the garden. I want to live in paradise. Guess what? Paradise isn't very profitable. <laughs> You're just happy. I want community. Uh, we materialism. Once again, I I I've, I love to study history, philosophy, religion, architecture. I think it's all one thing. Um, we were warned about the evils of materialism and worldliness, for that matter. Worldliness is where this virus came from. Uh, the more we mess stuff, mess with stuff, the more we will be messed with. Less is more. I mean, what a what a trite saying, but it's absolutely true. Uh, what a life to live in a community that I know my neighbors, I trust them, I feel safe, I can grow my food, at least a lot of it nearby. The people nearby have businesses in their homes. I can walk to them. In my yard, I've got fruit and nut trees, not mowed lawn and trees that are just there. <laughs> if branches fall off. I don't know. These these little land, you know, curb appeal things with streets out front, lights on, which nobody's ever on anyway because there's nowhere to go. Uh, I, guess I, I want everything. I want everything that I've been denied. You talked about not being able to control light. There's some things we control. I can do drugs. I can drink. I can eat a lot of high-fat foods and watch TV. 
that I have control over. Isn't that odd? Those are all consumer items that people profit off of. Oh, and then when I eat that stuff and do that, I get sick and make other people profit. What if, what if, what if I could live my life? I mean, there's literally, eh, literally slash figurative laws against that. You know, the, the cities zone out homeowned businesses. They insist you have to have, to have the street lights. You know, you have to have this, you have to have that. Uh, you have to have a certain amount of parking for these businesses when a lot of times it's completely gratuitous and not needed. Yeah, and, and somehow, yeah, and the insurance companies insist that you have lights on all night, you know, that kind of thing. It's like, well, that's not, I guess it sounds good on the surface, but once again, it's that thing you get addicted to it. It's like, oh, now I have to have that. It's like, no, you never mm-hmm. needed it in the first place it was serving somebody else's purpose back to the power generation. Let's lower the need. I'm a builder and an architect. I came up with my building system because I fix so many other people's projects that are done for profit. Excuse me. This is why, this is why on the light pollution issue, this is on the light pollution issue. And I've said this before, Jane, that the only way out of the safety issue, the only way, is for the EPA to declare wasted light at night as hazardous waste. That's the only way mm-hmm. to stop the safety issue. Because otherwise insurance companies, lawyers, people that want to sue are going to ride that assumption, okay, that more, oh, you didn't have lights on in the back, so it's actually your fault, not the person's fault or the, whatever. They're looking to get money from somebody, okay? And um, the other lawyers, thing whoops, is... Whoops, <laughs> the other, well, the other thing is actually what you one of the ideas you came up with on an, another podcast, Mike, which is starting from the assumption that more light actually is less safe. Yes. And I will tell you on a little aside here, I was invited to uh, to a zoning board meeting about um, so a lighting disagreement just <laughs> within the past week. Okay. And what I saw was just you know your your um, typical players spouting off these arguments about lighting that nauseate me truly Mm -hmm. that more light is safer and that um they're one of the lawyers spoke up saying that um you just don't know what a jury's gonna say and if there's any indication that less light levels are there that they're just gonna go right for the landlord and that is an easy ticket in less light being the the reason. And so it's all of these misconceptions that are really leading us there. So I I think another idea is not just the one that you said, another idea is starting from the assumption and studying that way. And I actually said that in the meeting. I said, well, actually you can create blind spots, you can create tripping hazards by over adapting the eye to brightness. And so, you know, you could actually argue the other direction. And I said, you know, you don't, you never know what a jury's going to say. So I tried to kind of create a little murkiness in the in the lawyer's argument in that meeting Mm -hmm. but it's um it's something that is not well understood by the public and so we are really there i interrupted you mike but i i just wanted to interject that this is truly a conversation that happens again and again in the public it's a failed assumption we're operating mark mark we're operating on a bunch of failed assumptions with a lot of this sort of thing um, you know, the one that your, your idea of corporatism, okay, that's an interesting way to think about um, where America has come in, you know, 40 or 50 years um, where the... If I could, there, there, there's another term and it's logical fallacies. Mm-hmm. That's what I see. And they're very much prom- promulgated by people that have read a little bit of something off the internet somewhere. And boy, do they have strong opinions about it. It's like, and you're like, no, I've studied city planning and I'm a lighting consultant and, 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 and. There's this place on the way I drive to Kansas City sometimes. It's, uh, I think, Liberty, Missouri. The lights coming off the parking lots are so bright, I can barely see. And then you're kind of dealing with that on one side. And then they've got barriers in the middle to tell you how bad the bright lights are. They don't want you being blinded by those. Well, then the cars come up over the top of them. So it's like, it's like, I'm being, I, it's being in a flash. Yeah. By the way, they use flash grenades to disable people, right? In riots. 
that's what that is, and you're telling me that's safe? How is that? And I go from a very brightly lit area to, and then, yeah, right after that, you're going, quote, unquote, out into the country, and it's dark. And it's like, no, nah, I can't see. You know, it's like, it's going to take me a little while for my eyes to adjust. Oh, and then and then the super bright LED headlights are going to come over and, like, you know, it's like, who thought this up and thought this was a good idea? It's it's, guess, it's, it's, it's what you said. It's it's a failed assumption. It's they're failed assumptions. They're what was the term you used before? That um, logical fallacy. Lo, they're logical oh, fallacies. Sorry. Like they make sense. You know, like when people when you when people talk about oh yeah, well, what what you need is more light. You know, and the lighting industry has no maximum light values. So, for example, the oh, IES, the Illuminating Engineering Society, mm -hmm. does not. Mm -hmm. First of all, they don't. They don't. I don't know if they've changed it. They may have now, Jane. But they used to very recently. They did not measure vertical foot candles only, or, or vertical lux only horizontal, right? So, mm -hmm. they don't. They didn't measure vertical. And the second thing was there was no maximum light levels, right? For anything, there was never a maximum put on anything. And so this is all. These are all logical fallacies. But you know, I think there's hope, and I, I would say that. Um, I, I don't like hope. I don't like optimism. I don't like those positions in people's minds because, you know, if you, you, you optimists always die first. That's kind of whenever you're reading a novel about it. We're going to the war will be over by Christmas, Mark. The war will be over by I have, Christmas. I have, a you know? say, I have a saying for you. What's that? A pessimist thinks things are fine the way they are. An optimist thinks they can be so much better. Wait a minute. You said that wrong. No, I did not at all. Okay, did you see the, the image I sent you of the automated transportation system? And that's just sure. my yes. version. There's bunches of them. Guess what? That gets rid of streets. That gets rid of parking lots. That gets rid of tires and cars and da 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 Now I can actually have a city that's got cafes and things that where there used to be a street. I'm going to walk around at night, and I'm going to have these light posts that are 8 feet tall, not 28 feet tall. You know? And so it's like, for our listeners, we just got just rid of all that. describe what this is it's like a skyway kind of like if you've ever gone skiing it's like a gondola like a little pod to kind of carry you through the city elevated but also with a structure i might point out that lets the light through so part of the reason why elevated trains weren't a perfect solution is that they really darken the cityscape below but the the renderings that you showed mark were these beautiful pods that could almost be like a tourist getaway experience as you're sailing through the, the, the upper heights of a city and then you get off. It's a very pleasant solution. And I think it's obviously funding why we haven't done it and maybe a few other things, but uh, yeah. Well, we're, we're, we're at the cusp. We either, we're about to put what, $2 trillion into a, ridiculously out of date transportation system. It's basically horseless carriages with kerosene lanterns only pumped way up, you know? Okay. We still got the tires. We still got the hard surfaces. We still have the noise, the light, the da, 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 and, and, and oh, bridges. And this is, this just gets rid of all of that. If we're going to, uh, and again, if we're going to colonize the moon, Mars, none of this is going to work there. Uh, private partnership, private public partnership right now they're talking about drones automated delivery systems there, there was literally a bill i read about this morning that's going to allow autonomous delivery devices this wouldn't be all of that it would be high-speed rail and electric cars and automated delivery and it would incorporate all the utilities which by the way are also decaying if you're going to upgrade it do it all and make my life wonderful not some burden that's like optimism hell i'm talking practicality now i'm going to walk places i'm going to be healthy nobody wants to pay for health care good let's have a transportation system that is conducive to good health so we can be can we can afford to be healthy all this stuff is such a huge financial liability everybody complains about it except the people putting in all the infrastructure and repairing it so what I'm hearing, Mark, is that your comment really on the lighting pollution problem is that it's not a singular problem and that to really solve it, you have to really step back and look at things more systemically so that you can address things in the holistic way of um, creating a more long lasting solution. So one of, one of my tenants is don't solve problems, get rid of them. 
What a concept, yeah. huh? Uh, so we could address lighting pollution with better design light fixtures. I design them all the time. Heaven forbid, light shields, baffles, color temp, that kind of thing. Sure, but but we still have the problem that it's supporting, which is absolutely horrible. You guys ever been to Spain or Italy, like sure. old places? Yeah. They were designed for horses and carriages and people walking. The whole quote unquote economic system could collapse tomorrow and those people would still be living and probably going about their life like they kind of always had. New York City, LA, holy Ned, you better get out of there as fast as you can because all of a sudden the supply is going to be shut off. It doesn't work without all that stuff. I would love a city that was like, oh, the power went off yesterday. Oh, it did? Huh. Oh, okay, whatever. <laughs> I'm going to go see my friends. Tell me when it comes back on. <laughs> whatever. Yeah, you can't live in Canada, though, in, in those kinds of scenarios. Like, Canada, they, like, while I agree with, you, you know, the idea of the blue sky, blue ocean thinking, I think I think what would be, would be a better way to, and I've been to places in Germany, like, say, southern in Bavaria, where you go there and it almost seems like you're going back in time and you'll eat at a restaurant and the trout was caught in the stream at the back of the restaurant like, like it's it's kind of mind-blowing maybe it's going forward in time maybe it's maybe. going forward in time well i, I mean listen listen uh, for, uh first nations tribes have always lived beside the most advanced civilizations and we still have that so i mean th there's there can be a reversion to a mean we could have economic collapse i think that's a hilarious why people invest in bitcoin as a hedge against the collapse of the u.s dollar is if they think that electricity will still be around if society collapses <laughs> Like it doesn't make any sense to me. You, you understand what I'm saying? Like, yeah. like uh, it's uh, like, oh, Mike, what, Mike, I, I, I'm I, buying Bitcoin because I think the world's going to collapse. Oh, and you'll still have a computer with electricity that you're going to trade your bitcoins on, are you? It's so kooky I, I for burn Cocoa my Pops. music. I burn my I burn my music to CDs because I'm sure. going to have my solar voltaic out there. I'm going to listen sure. to tunes while you guys are looking at your your uh, music service. <laughs> so I, going, one uh, one of the themes that comes up on this yeah comes up on this this show a lot is the idea of awe and the idea of that we're lacking in a sense of spirituality and and that oh, leads absolutely. to that that leads to some of these bizarre decisions and the removal of agency mm -hmm. as well that addictions. I think addictions addictions you know you know I think the restoration if we could do it first. Now you may say, well, I don't think you should do dark skies first. I think we need to look at things holistically. I'm not sure, Jane. I think that, you know, if we were able to move this issue and we're, we are moving it from basically non-existent on the table to now it's moving, ratcheting up in the lighting industry. Um, everybody's talking about it now. And I, I think if we were able to solve the dark sky issue and bring back the stars and the dark sky and the Milky Way back into people's lives, that the the rest of it would start to make more sense. Like the, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the people wouldn't be chased, like, and I, I know you're a yoga instructor, but I think the explosion of meditation in yoga is because people are searching for some sort of darkness and silence, Jane Slade. I don't know if you agree oh, with that. Oh, I was like, Mark, are you a yoga instructor? <laughs> so um, we, what we, were you we need to say, take Mark? a giant. We need to take a giant step forward in the opposite direction is one of my sayings I came up with. Sure. The spirituality, that's the thing about the the Bible and all that. To me, it's a uh, science with male agenda put on it. The whole thing about materialism, somebody somewhere back then said, no, we can't consume more than we use because we know the logical conclusion. You know, and pretty much anything excess, you eat too much food, you get fat, you're not healthy. You consume too much you throw out garbage it's not recyclable you pollute the land you oh, oh i love that one uh, the, uh, the first shall be last and the last shall be first i'm pretty sure that is referring to an indigenous peoples it's like the people that have been marginalized and pushed aside will now be the very people that will have the ability to understand not only how to survive but thrive it's like good now the bad neighbors are gone <laughs> Let's Mark, I to want to push back on something that you said earlier, which is that, sure. you know, environmental design um, is not profitable or it's not free because you or it's free. So you can't really charge. 
didn't say that. But. You said something along the lines of I, it's I, not I, desirable to industry because it's not as easily profitable. Is that more true to what you were saying? Well, uh, so, so, for example, my building system, uh, mm -hmm. it doesn't, it uses very little wood. Okay. It uses mm -hmm. very little concrete. It doesn't need extra shingles. It doesn't need extra siding. It doesn't need maintenance. It has very small uh, conditioning equipment. That's not attractive in a growth economy paradigm. It's no. Well, here's we my point. Here's more my and more point. More and more. Which is that the dark sky is invaluable and oh, you cannot we... quantify its meaning. And so Absolutely. if we try and put that even in a framework of economy, which is actually a tiny human concept, w when you compare it to the night sky, that there is no measurement possible. So it's I sacred. Think that it's sacred, and that's one of the things we've lost. Yeah. Nothing is sacred in a growth economy. If you've got to make return to your investors no matter what, well, that's too bad. It's collateral damage, and it's just too bad. So getting back then to one of the themes of this show, which is really the concept that the dark sky is invaluable, that this loss marks uh, a, a great shift inside the human psyche, a disconnection that is dangerous. So yeah. as someone who utilizes amber step lights in your home, very low level to the ground so that even your own retina is only being adapted at the tiniest level on the, mm -hmm. on the tiniest, lowest level of your retina. Why does night matter to you? You saw my saying in my quote, uh, I ain't no vampire, but I sure do love the night. Uh, Del Schmidt, the sofa Kings. It's magical. It's uh, <sighs> our, Boy, I wish I could show you my piece of stained glass. Uh, one, it, there's a lead part of it, which looks kind of like a pterodactyl flying off. And it's being driven away by the cacophony. A dragon has caught the sun and is breathing flames over it, which goes up and colors the bottom of the sky. So all the wonderful unknowns, the, the, the dream parts of your mind, now they're bathed in bright light. It was like, I didn't want that. I, I, I can't visualize. I can't dream. When I, when I design, a lot of times it's on my elliptical with my eyes closed and music on. I don't want to see everything. I want, mm. I want that mm -hmm. in, I want to go inside of me. I don't want to be, I don't, I don't want all this. You said overstimulation. It's distracting. I have to get rid of that somehow. Uh, like I said, nothing sacred. The night is sacred. It, it is. Mm -hmm. There's just so many things that can happen at night that don't happen in the middle of the day. And, oh, and of course, the darkest hour comes before the dawn, right? You go, isn't that ironic? Mm -hmm. Because there is no darkness anymore. <laughs> Maybe the dawn is mm -hmm. not going to come because everything's lit up all the time. I think we've lost. Oh, there's another one. Everything you gain is something you've lost. If you gain light, you lose stars. If you gain the ability to get food at any time, you lose your health and your ability to survive and your resiliency. Uh, Mike, what you got? Oh, yeah. You're playing our game here, buddy. That's between me and Jane of who's going to jump in. <laughs> so I, I, think oh, it was, okay. I think it was Frank Torino who said dark sky is resource. Is that, that's kind of the mindset when he said that. It's, it's a resource. Um, and what we're talking about when you're talking about light pollution or you're talking about – you know, um, uh, you know, a farmer, a commercial farm spraying chemicals. Okay, these are externalities, right? So they may have the legal right to spray chemicals on their fields, or they, you know, the city may have the legal right to its, you know, its lamp posts and all this sort of stuff. But it, it, the agency has been lost to say, you know, hey, that may be your land and your right, but if it comes on as a light trespass, or if it comes on as a uh, roundups blows onto my garden and kills my food. That's that's in a in a way, um, you know, a civil offense. Like you you've done something to destroy my property. But we haven't got to the point in our minds where we said that. You're talking about restoring the sacred. 
Jane, I think it starts, and Mark, I think it starts with Dark Skies because if we could give mm -hmm. people that back, that would restore, like automatically people would have an opportunity to engage in awe and experiences that they don't have to try to learn how to do. And that's yoga can give it to you, meditation can give it, give it to you. But these things take practice. They're a lot of work. They take time out of your day. They don't naturally occur to you. But if you go on a walk with your dog at night and all of a sudden you're in the park and you see the Milky Way, you're not going to get used to it. You're always going to look at it and go, holy shit, I am such a small little person in this enormous yeah. universe. And that humility will dawn upon you and it will be a gift to humanity and to Earth. That's my... That, that's you, you can oh, literally feel after 5, 10, 15 minutes under a night sky, you can feel the oh, pace of your thoughts shift. Oh, yes. And this is a departure we're not taking anymore. We used mm -hmm. to get that on the daily. We don't mm -hmm. get that anymore. And with the bombardment, uh, I heard this term blitzkrieg of information blitzkrieg, on our phones. Yeah. Uh, you know, when when that's what we're up against, there's never been a, a bigger need for that departure of that pace. And we're just not. It's only going to get anymore. worse. It's uh, like I said, you'll notice this, these are the kind of things I observe. You'll notice the explosion of home meal kits and that kind of stuff. And the explosion of restaurants and fast food, that's because our time is no longer available to us anymore. Guess what? That's also mm -hmm. very profitable. The role, the first role of government, which is the antithesis of corporatism, is to protect the rights of the individual. Well, I don't want light on my property. I want to see the stars. That's nice. Go away. I don't want Roundup on it. That's nice. Go away. I don't want, I want our, our rivers here literally look like vomit mixed with diarrhea. I mean, it is, don't swim in them. The joke is if you were dying of thirst and it was, would you drink out of the river or the, the squeegee bucket at the gas station? <laughs> it's like, it would be a toss up because someone's taken that away from me. Uh, there is a thread on a newspaper article I was on the other day. And it was about the ability of people to hit people with their cars while they're protesting if they're in the street. And this guy was saying, well, this is the law. There's nothing wrong with that. And I said, who wrote the laws? The people that wrote the laws, it doesn't actually affect them. It, that, that's wrong. Why? Uh, my daughter is very much a libertarian. So in other words, like, you know, uh, my freedom's in where yours begin. It shouldn't be like that. If my rights were respected, you know, we would have an environment that was healthy and we would have good food and no light pollution, that kind of stuff. Well, that's not what the government is now supporting. This is why we don't have capitalism. Uh, our rights are not protected. It's all for the, it's our new God. It's the unquestioned God, which is a growth economy. And it's worshipped every day. There's a station. Oh, come on. Uh, the stock report comes on about every 15 minutes. That's how God, how well God's doing. That's what it is. Don't tell me that's not the most important thing in the world. It is every 15 minutes. And you go like, wow, that so Mark, tells me a whole lot. We're coming up yes. on the end of the show. And, you know, okay. Mike, do you have any last questions that you want to ask Mark? But just going to say what, what happened to the optimism? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I, well, this, well, we'll this is all going to take care of itself. Oh, so no. this, well, this is all going to take care of itself. Listeners, with a positive note, of, yes. because you're you are a visionary and you have so many fantastic ideas. Sure. And I do think it's it's because it's you are truly observing, um, without any shields, what's happening to our environment. And so, in those observations, I think it's not good. And so it does sound negative, but I think you really are just seeing the glass as half or it's just as half full or half empty or just as half for you. So maybe you glass call that a pessimist thing. Things... The glass well, is you twice are. as big as so, it needs to be. <laughs> to what, what should we leave our listeners with from Mark Clipsham? Okay, guys, we're in this incredible jet plane. It's fast. It's convenient. It's amazing. Mind you, I hate flying. <laughs> oh, whoops. Engines are starting to act kind of funky. Well, we have two choices. Should we keep flying until they quit and go down really fast? Or should we go, you know what? 
There's a runway up ahead. Let's start bringing this down. Let's start bringing this down. And let's bring the whole plane down, not just the dog or the cat or the luggage. Let's bring the whole thing down. The, the, the night sky, yes, that's part of it. But if you fix some things that are indicative that makes the rest of it kind of okay and institutionalized. I'm not arguing with, I'm just, this is an observation. Mm. We need to start addressing the whole thing. Uh, there's so many things in the world we don't need and that are unhealthy for us. Be healthy, become healthy, recognize what health is about, demand these things. It's like, well, I was going to go to your resort, but I, I wanted to see the stars in the sky at night and your whole place is lit up like a Christmas tree. Use your buying power to change things. If you don't Love want that. to pay for health care, stop eating bad food. If you want night skies, tell people that. Say like, you know what I would really like is to be to we'll go somewhere and, 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 you know, ecotourism, you know, it's like, say, this is really important to me. Healthy food, exercised night skies nature you know mm -hmm. make make your reality what you want your reality to be you have that power oh the price of coke went up stop drinking coke see what happens next week oh coke prices went down what's up with that people stop drinking it <laughs> it's like you have the power people mm -hmm. the, the houses pay the extra money well actually with mine costs much less um to get a good house that eliminates the need for the extra power generation. Uh, live somewhere where you can walk more likely. Pittsburgh was a great place to live, by the way, if you've ever been there. Uh, unfortunately, the sun doesn't shine for six months. But <laughs> it, it's a, there are wonderful places to live. Visit other places. That is one of the biggest downfalls, I think, is... So we went to Spain, walked everywhere, we're healthy. And I go, like, why can't we have that here? City council, you know, mayor. Like, people go there because it's wonderful and they love it. Can we, we can have that here. Why can't, why isn't it like that? So I, I think what I hear in your message is that people really need to take back their own agency and start mm. really demanding through their buying power, use this whole economy uh, for the environment instead of against it. And I think that's a fascinating idea. And we're just so thankful to have you on this show, to have this conversation with you. And um, yeah, we really appreciate your, your perspective. So thank you so much for joining us on Starving for Darkness. Thank you, Mark. Say, don't, don't take what they give you. Make your own meal. <laughs> I like that. Good to meet you, Jane. Good to meet you, Mike. Uh, and that's good because I'm older. Guess what needs to happen? <laughs> no, I'm not going to take a nap. Anyway, thank you guys for being out there. I Oh, one last one. The council person I was talking to, she works at what I call the hippie grocery store, the local co-op. She's told me about, and, I, and it, it inspired me. They had a huge ice storm and all the power lines went down. And she said she walked out that night and just looked up at the sky Mm. awestruck you know it's like oh yeah. oh it's like it could be like that all the time it just yeah. it's magical the night is magic thank you guys for being there thank you by the way i don't agree on the nukes but whatever and a hundred thousand years of storage man i i don't have all the answers but i do problems are take care psst. Psst. hey don't go anywhere yet because we have some instructions for you. It's Michael and Greg from Get a Grip on Lighting. Yeah, we do the ads for Starving for Darkness. You got to go to KeystoneTech.com. That's K-E-Y-S-T-O-N-E-T-E-C-H.com. Light made easy, Greg. You've been able to rattle that off real well. Uh, there's a new line of exterior fixtures from Keystone that they have available, and they're going to continue to expand on it. And they're doing things right. And one of those that they're doing right is in their wall packs. They're making them full cut off. That's going to eliminate undesirable sky glow and glare and that's what we all want it looks nice it fits a profile of a lot of your old nasty fixtures and has multiple wattages and kelvins that can cover you there get rid of those old nasties go to keystonetech.com that's k-e-y-s-t-o-n-e-t-e-c-h.com 
Thanks for listening to Starving for Darkness. Bye for now.